So yeah, we're talking about minutia today, that's, that's for sure. Um, so before I start, I want to point out that we have an online course now, and it's, you have one day left to complete it. It, <laughs> it ends today or tomorrow, but it's going to, the, the lectures and the, and the, the uh, quizzes are going to stay online. So you can take the quizzes, it'll grade it for you. You won't get a certificate, but you can, get, you can see how you're doing. And, I, and the, discussions, the discussion will be open as well, but we won't be answering as many questions as we did during the eight weeks of, of the class. But you can go and see what other people asked. And so that, that's the website. You can just Google data, data analysis for genomics, edX, and you'll find it. Uh, then the other thing I wanted to point out is that we have this, um, everybody here have used GitHub before? Who has not used GitHub? Well, okay. So GitHub is really, it's, if you're going to be programming or especially if you're going to be collaborating on projects, it's a, it's a very nice tool where you can have your code up and other people can edit it and also it keeps keeps a backup for you, it keeps versions for you, it's really nice. It has to, if you have stuff on GitHub, it has to be public, or, or unless you pay. That's how they get you. Uh, and it's, we used it for the class. We have all the, so what we did for the class is we had, um, for every lecture, we had a little RMD. Have you guys been working on R markdowns in the class? Cool. So. So you know about R Markdown. So every lecture has an R Markdown that includes the code that was used to make the figures that we show in the class. And then there's also homeworks in R Markdown. And it's, so it's all, we use this, this new um, tool that some very nice person put together that will take stuff that you put on GitHub and it'll automatically make it into a web page. So I can show you the web page real quick. Uh, yeah, so this is the GitHub repository with, with the course. You can see the weeks, and the homeworks, and there's some data set, example data sets are also up there. So you, it's very easy to just get all, you can get a whole course in one shot if you go here and, and download it as a zip file. But you can also follow it and fork it. If you fork it, you have your own copy on your computer. And one of the most fascinating things that has come out of this course is that I am getting free editing <laughs> from the community because people uh, make edits when they see a typo. They, they fix it and they just put it up. And they, I have to approve it, but it's almost always, they're almost always right. Um, so it was, it was very, very nice. A lot, we got the community f editing the, book, the, the, the notes for us. So you can go to the GitHub page, but you can, and you can also go to the book. Where's the book? So this is what the book, oh no, that's not what I wanted. What did I just search for? <laughs> <laughs> He's, look at this guy. I was not, I was not on purpose. <laughs> there it is, okay. That could have been much worse, by the way. Um, you know, I won't say what I could have typed. Okay, so um, this is the book, and if you go like for today, you can go to the to the batch effect one, and you can see the co this is this would be the code you would need to make the figures that I'm going to show you. So this is the this is the HTML version of the R Markdown, but you can see the code is there. There's there's the first figure I'm going to show you, etc. They're not they're not polished yet, but we're, we keep working on these, and eventually, it'll, it'll hopefully be an actual book. Okay. So there, those are some of the resources. If you want to do a lab on your own later, you can just they're all you can just follow along the code that we have up here. Okay. So back to our point. Okay. Uh, all right. So so batch effects are a general name that is given to a type of unwanted variability that we see in genomics data. It's, it's a pretty much any high throughput data from biology that I've seen, I have seen batch effects. We first saw it in microarrays, and there's a lot of papers written about batch effects that are 
on microarrays, but that's, I don't, that's not because microarrays are more prone to batch effects. That's because there's more public data on microarrays. That's the only reason you see that. There's, it's in everything. Um, sequencing, especially when you do PCR, it gets really bad. So uh, you, you, there, there's, people not always call it a batch effect. But I'm, I'm going to use that term generally. I'm going to explain. I'm going to get into the mathematics of what I mean by that later. Uh, it's not like a small little detail that you have to take care of. So the statisticians are happy. This, this is the kind of thing that can get you um, in the news if you don't <laughs> do it right. This is just one example. There's actually other, other examples of this is perhaps a, the most uh, high profile one where this, there was this paper in the Lancet uh, claiming they could tell ovarian cancer from just serum. <coughs> and it was basically these two statisticians showed, this is Keith Baggerly and Kevin Combs, they show that it was all a batch effect. And it was reported in the New York Times. That's the New York Times um, article on the left, which I think is read more than the Lancet. So it's not like a small little thing. It can confuse you completely and, and make you think you have discovered something important when you really haven't. So we're going to talk about how, what, is, what happened that they, they thought, how could they possibly think they could do that, um, and how a batch effect caused it to happen. So I'll, I won't use that data, but I'm going to use another data set that was also a controversial finding. OK, so Aideen talked to you guys about uh, distances and clustering and all that, right? So we're going to use a little bit of that in, the, in, this, in these lectures. It's a nice way to see batch effect is using pictures like th th related to distance and, and high, and high, um, high principal components. So this, this is a picture you can make it with a book. Um, it's from expression data. And basically, what I have is a big matrix with many replicates of like uh, eight tissues, seven tissues. You can see, if you count the colors, you know how many tissues there are. So every color there is a tissue. And if you have a magnifying glass, you can read which one it is. Uh, and, but the color tells you what's what. All right, so this is. This is basically you have a big gene expression matrix, and you just blindly run hierarchical clustering on Euclidean distance, and you get this, which looks great, right? You can see the yellow over there, and then the green, and then there's whatever that is, magenta, purple. Now, if you look a little closer, if you look closer, there's, a, there's an area where there's a little bit something weird going on. You guys see where it is? Mm -hmm. So the purple and orange are mixed up. And those, those all happen to be brain areas. I think they're cerebellum and hippocampus. Yeah. So orange is hippocampus, and, and purple is cerebellum. But you can see that there's all these cerebellums over there. And then there's a split up here. And then, oh, I think I'm not, I'm not connected to anything, right? So um, do you see these guys here? I feel like I am. Yeah, so, and then there's some cerebellum here, too. That's way far away. You guys learn to read dendrograms. You see how far away this is? It has all, you have to go all the way up to the, to the top. OK, so let's look at the close-up. So let me also say, I, I, pref I don't like dendrograms very much. They, um, they're not as, for some things, they're, they're fine. But the reason I don't like them that much is because they're, they're, they're hard to, it's, it's hard to see what the distance between two things is. You have to you know, go up and find where they split. I, I think they're fine, but I prefer M MDS plots if you really want to see how close things are. Um, these plots have the, huh? MDS? Oh, we haven't, uh, sorry, they didn't cover that. So multidimensional scaling is a very nice um, approach. And it's basically, in, in, in with, if you're using Euclidean distance, it's the same thing as looking at principal components. It's the same thing. You just take the first two principal components and you plot them. So the, you, can, you can, if you do a little bit of math, you can show that if you want to, if you, you have two, so what do we have here? Each point here is, a, is what? What is a, in its origin, what is a point? So each one of these is a sample, right? So mathematically, what's a point originally? What is it? A what? I can't hear you. Yeah, 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 right, but we go back to the, to the beginning. 
what was that point originally, mathematically, before you got to, the, to this picture, when you start the whole process? Tissue. It's a tissue, right? So what is, what, is, what is the mathematical entity that you have, that you work with? It's like this vector of gene expression, right? It has 20,000 points. So if we wanted to plot, if we wanted to make a plot of these things, it would have to be in 20,000 dimensional space. If you really want to have all the dimensions. And when we compute the distance between two of these vectors, you're actually taking every single dimension, right? And it goes into the equation of the distance. So if you, so what, what happens if you, if you do principal component analysis, then you have the, the, the first, the distance between any two things can be very well approximated by the principal components that explain most of variability. So if you, have, if you have two principal components, that's not what happens here. But if you happen to have two principal components that explain 99.9% .9 of, the, of the variability, let's suppose, that's not common, but let's suppose you have that, then if you think about it, then the distance of those two numbers, of the two numbers you get from the two principal components, has to be the same distance you get if you use all 20,000. Because all the variance is in there. Right? So if you think that the first two principal components explain a lot of the, many, much of the variability, then this, the distance between two points in this picture that you were saying, x and y, is similar to the distance between the actual two points, which is our 20,000 dimensional vectors. That's a very nice mathematical thing to, to, to have, right? Because now you can actually look at it, and the distance is somewhat preserved. How preserved it is depends on how much variability the first two components explain. But you can also start making, you can start making MDS plots with more um, dimensions of going down the principal components. So you could have one and two, one and three, two and three. You can keep doing like that and two in, in scatter plots, which is really the only thing we can really see. Once you, you know, you should avoid making pseudo 3D plots. There, you, our eyes are totally confused by that. Until we get holograms like Princess Leia, you know, like, we shouldn't bother with, with that. Um, it, it's just going to confuse your eye. So I like to just take two dimensions and just plot different two dimensions. One and two, two and three, et cetera. OK, so in this picture, this is, um, these are all the plots I showed you earlier, but in two dimensions. You see how now it's a little bit clearer what the separations are than in the previous picture? And you can see our, our problematic, our, our, the guys that were, that were kind of weird over here. Cerebellum and hippocampus, there's like these, these um, cerebellums that are far away from those cerebellums, and these, these hippocampus are closer to those. So those, those are the, this is the same plot, but instead of hierarchical plot, it's an MDS. <coughs> okay, so here, here are, now I'm just showing you the, t the two tissues, MDS of just those two tissues, and now you can see that those guys up there are far from these guys, and they're closer to these guys. Right, so that's the, that's the problem. So now I'm going to change the color. And I'm going to show you, instead of the tissue, I'm going to show you the study where they came from. OK, so now you're seeing that, where that variability is coming from. It's not biology. It seems to be something else. Right, so the, the, these, these magenta ones are different from the orange ones. It's a different study from GEO. And I, I have an even better example of that. Here's, another, here's more data from GEO. Now I'm including other brain regions. And you see the, the thyroid. See those guys? See these and those? What do you, so now what do you think that is? So now, now I'm going to show you the, the study. You see, now it's perfectly explained by study. So the study is... is has, there's this variability that has to do with the study, and now this I would call a batch. Right, so they, they had a batch of, of, of samples in one lab, and six months later they had a batch of samples in some other lab, and that batch effect is stronger than the tissue effect. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So yeah. 
Mm -hmm. We'll have, we'll show you one from the same side. We'll sh I'll show you one. The one we're going to do, we're going to look at very closely is from the same, it's one, of, one big study that just went through time. And they, they you know, they had year, they went, they went, there were years going by and, and things changed. But yeah, we also, I remember one of my experiences with one of the labs that I used to collaborate with. Um, I, was, I saw one of these things and I said, what happened on August 3rd, 2008? And they're like, how the hell did you know? They're like, we changed the reagent that day. They were like, were surprised. But it's actually nothing, nothing special. You make a plot and you see it right away. But it was very clear that, well, that something happened that day. And it was a reagent ran out and they bought a new one. Same lab. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, good question. So sometimes you have to go deeper into the into the PCs to see these things. Yeah, we're gonna see that again later. Yeah. So for for so it is, I'm I'm picking extreme examples to illustrate. So this is this is a little bit of an extreme example in two ways. One is that brain tissues are actually pretty similar in their gene expression, and second, these are very very strong batch effects. But there are, in a typical, I'm glad you asked that because I should say that in a typical experiment, in a typical data set, tissue variability is much stronger than batch. When you, when you have like liver, liver and kidney and, and, and cerebellum, then it's going to, and you actually saw it in the earlier ones. The, bigger, the biggest, biggest separate, let me just put that back so, I, so you can get some faith back on, on, on high throughput technology. There. Batch isn't the biggest effect, right? It's, it's, you know, whatever separates placenta from these other tissues, right? And I think maybe there's liver here, too. Colors aren't great. Yeah, but you even see, you, you know, in a good, in a typical data set, you'll see things separating out by the lineages and then within the lineages by tissue. Okay, so um, this is not this is not even unique to to biology. It's been around for a while, and it just hasn't you know we don't call it the batch effect, but it, this this phenomena has been going on for 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 a long time since we since we've measured. And this is an example I like because it's physicists who think they are so great at measuring everything. No, just kidding. They actually are. They actually are. <laughs> But they, they um, have batch effects, too. So this is, this is a plot. Have you guys follow, seen what they actually say? This is the speed of light uh, estimated. And then what, when, it was, when the estimate was published, right? So we're going, can't be too hard on them. This is going back 140 years, 115 years. Um, but you can, you can see batch effects. You guys see it? So, so what, what, what's being plotted here is, so in, in 1890 something, some group measured the speed of light. You know, you turn the switch and you, <laughs> and you stop, use your stopwatch, and then they, they publish this, this estimate, which is it's just actually incredibly close to the, to the correct answer. For, you know, for that time, it's really impressive. But um, they also include a confidence interval. And here's another one, and they also include a confidence interval. And then here's another one, with a tiny, tiny confidence interval. This is the same group publishing two speeds of light estimates with confidence interval. So they're saying, they're, if, they, if they believe both their answers, they're saying the speed of light changed. <laughs> right? That's what it says. So, so what is it? What's the... Now, if you look at the plot, if you, look, if you forget that first one up there, if you stick to the 20th century, um, and you look at that plot, it, 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 you, can see the, you can see the right answer, and you can see what, the error, what their error was. You, you can see that it wasn't really um, a mistake. It's the, the, the mistake in the estimates. The mistake was in their, in their estimates of the variability. So notice that if you look at if you just look at the points and how much they vary, yeah, forget about their own estimates of variance. It's about this much, right? Right. That's a, the standard deviation is about that much. 
And they're all, and you know, if you, if you took a met, what's called now a meta-analysis, you would have said the speed of light is this much, and the standard error is that much, and you would have gotten it right. So what's the the mistake here is that there is a batch effect that introduces variability, and they can't, you can't see that when you when you're doing your own study, because you don't have, you only have your own measurements. You don't get to see the others, other people's measurements. So the, ba the, the batch effect variability here is, th is this variability. And then within their own, they had like, you know, they had like whatever it was, some many measures. Actually, they had, this is a standard error, so it must have been bigger. But they, they underestimate, or they just didn't know that there was, a, there was an effect of the measurement technology or the lab or whatever. And they, they, there's another plot. Um, you can see it in this paper where they show it in the, from the 60s to today, and you still see, you know, how that, I think that the speed of light is slowly increasing because some, you know, something got better in the technology and they were consistently underestimating it. And now it's, and now it started to converge. Okay, so that's um, introduction to the batch effect. I can put up. Okay. So any, any questions before I continue? Now we're going to tell you how it can get you, can really get you. And then we're going to talk about how to fix it. How, well, how to deal with it, as best as we know today, using statistical techniques. OK. So the first thing I want to talk about uh, is confound. I want to, well, through, while we talk about this particular example, we're going to be talking about something that statisticians call confounding. Uh, and it's, well, I'll, I'll just explain it with an example. But it's, it's very common in, in misinterpretation of, of data. Like, I, I just saw one, I'll share it with you, because I just saw this recently, where there was a study claim, <laughs> claiming that, that um, kids that do more homework do worse in class. And yeah, and it, but if you think about it, and they were saying that you sh we shouldn't do some, no, pa kids whose parents help with homework do worse, right? But if you think about that for a second, you realize it kind of it makes sense that that's the case. I'm going to make it more extreme. Kids who take tutoring or remedial math do worse in math, right? But it's not the remedial classes. So that, that's an example of confounding where you're, where, where the two groups being compared Say that the kids who take remedial math tutoring and the kids who don't are different in a way other than the, the classes. Right? The fact that they're in the remedial classes to begin with means that they're not good testers or whatever you want to call it. So it's th that's confounded with the actual intervention, which is to give them remedial classes. Similarly, for the homework, parents helping with them homework. So if your kid is just does the homework on their own and get A's, well, you don't help them. If they're having trouble, you help them. So it's conf I, I, I think that's a, an, another example of confounding. There's a punch. If you read the newspaper and you're a statistician, you're like, oh, another <laughs> confounding. I got, I'll, I'll, yeah, so I, yeah, I'll give you one more. There was one that said that, that yelling at your kids to, um, made them eat more. And I know what was happening. They were yelling. They were yelling, "Stop eating those Cheetos!" Right? So there was the kids who was eating a lot are getting yelled at for eating. So it's not the yelling; it's just that they're naturally more prone to eat Cheetos. Okay. So let's talk about it in genomics. In genomics, it's a little, maybe a little bit more subtle, though not that much subtle. Though. So here's here's a one example I'm going to use, and the data is on the GitHub page. You can actually also get it from GEO. This was a study that compared two ethnic groups, gene expression. And when they compared the two ethnic groups, they had, I don't know, some do had dozens of samples in each, in each group. They, they did it. I'm assuming you guys have done t-tests and volcano plots and all that stuff. P-value. Huh? Not both? OK. So, okay, so uh, volcano plot is, is, is simple. I'll explain it in a second. So, but they just did t-test on each gene. 
right? And so they get the an effect size. That's the, the, the average difference between the eth ethnic group one minus ethnic group two. So like the average fold change or average differential expression. That's on this axis. Each point is a gene. And then you get a T statistic that you can look up on a table and get a p-value. And here's a histogram of the p-values. And here is the log. Here are the p-values in the, in the uh, what is this called, log score, log score scale or whatever, minus log 10 of the p-value. So 0.01 is somewhere around here. right? 2 is 0.01. 3 is 0.01. So the higher you go, the, the smaller the p-value. And those guys now up there are astronomically small, I guess I should say astronomically big. So um, they're very small. So microscopically small. All right, so that's what the, that's what the volcano plot it does. It's, I, I think it's a great little plot because you can see both the effect size and the p-value. This way, you know, when you have a very small p-value and you're very excited, you can very quickly down your excitement when you see the <laughs> effect size is tiny, right? like in GWAS studies, where the, the p-values are small because they do like a million people, but their effect sizes are very little. So this, sh this plot shows you both in one plot. The histogram is just showing us the p-values. OK, so when you look at these two plots, the conclusion you come to is that most genes are differentially expressed, which, I don't know, I'm not a biologist, but that just sounds crazy. This is blood. <coughs> but I mean, I, I, it, I, don't, I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't even know 70% of genes were on at all in a specific tissue, but here they're saying they're, they're differentially expressed. And it's not, it's not like it's a tiny little effect size and all that. Like, here, this is one. That's full changes of two already, which is pretty big. All right, so let's look at this data more closely. So now we're going to see confounding at its worst. Here, the, the confounder is year. And here is the outcome of interest, which is uh, ethnic group. And so I'll let you look at that for a second and tell me what's, what's going on. What's So the, the way, I, the, the way you, I would say it is that ethnic group is confounded with the year, with the time it was done. So all ethnic group one was done after 2004, except three. And all ethnic group one, two was done before. So this is, com this is perfect confounding, com almost perfect. There's this Oh, no, they did. They did. It's not here. No, that's not confounding. But I, I couldn't, you can, you can make that plot I, yourself if you want, um, if, you, if you want, because the data is, is there. And actually, we do, we, I'll show you that I'm going to use sex to illustrate how do we correct for batch effects in a second, in, in a little bit later today. OK, so that's, that's um, what that table shows. So now I'm going to make another picture to show the problem of the batch effect. So, what I'm, gonna, what I'm doing in this picture, look, you, you can see it looks very similar. So I can't remember what exactly I did, but it's in the code. It's, you can look at the code. But I, I think what I did is I took um, 2000. Well, I did something like the following. I took this group, and I compared it to that group. So it's the same ethnic group, but it's in two different years. And look at the look at this look at the data now. It's no now it's like okay it's not seventy percent but it's up there. It's like fifty or sixty percent of genes are differentially expressed, just by looking at different years, same ethnic group, different years. The p values are, are actually one reason the p values are smaller is because the the sample sizes are smaller, because the effect sizes are comparable. So now we, we know now, this, this plot is pretty clear. The date in which the array was ran can have an effect on gene expression. It's pretty clear. So now if I go back and ask, 
If I look at a gene now and I say, okay, I saw, uh, this gene was different between the two groups, between the, between the two ethnic groups, how do I know it's not the a date? How can I separate those two things out? Can't. In this case, you just can't. Right? So you have, when you compare ethnic group one to ethnic group two, there's two, th there's two differences in these two groups. One, they're different ethnic groups. Two, they were run in different years. The, I don't know if their ethnicity has an effect on gene expression. I've never seen any evidence of that. I'm pretty certain date does. So if I do see a difference in the comparison that it was published, how, I mean, how do I know it's not just the date? So in this particular case, it's, because it's perfectly confounded, I can't, I, we don't actually have a solution really for this problem. For, for this particular data set, me as a statistician, my, what I would conclude is we, we can't, this data set provides no evidence that there's differences between ethnic groups when it comes to gene expression. We don't, maybe there is, but this data set can't be used to answer that question because it's impossible to separate out the date from the real effects, from the biology. So, so the lesson from this part of the lecture is that you, when you're doing an experiment, when you're running a, an experiment, and you suspect there's going to be something that you're doing, it could be the technician, it could be the time, it could be the, 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 the reagents you buy. If you think one of those could have big effects like this, you want to, um, it's not, you, you know, you don't have to stop the experiment because there's going to be this effect, but you want to balance it. You don't want to confound it. And there's, there's, there's a whole field in statistics dedicated to this called experimental design, but it's not that hard to do. You know, you just make sure that each, if you're doing it before and after, if, you ha if you're going to be doing it in two summers, then you, ha you put half your cases and half your controls one summer, half your cases, half your controls in another summer. There will be a batch effect, but, but you're going to have at least a shot at dealing with it because you have them in both. And now I'm going to show you some statistical methods that can help you deal with batch effects as long as you don't have confounding like this. Perfect confound. All right, any questions? All right, well, another thing I, sh I should have said earlier, these data were normalized. In the paper, they were not normalized with quantile normalization, but in this here, when I'm doing it, they were quantile normalized. So whatever this thing is that's, that's changing from, from the year to year is not something that normalization can deal with. It's, it's, too, it's something else, something more subtle that is not something you can catch. And you'll see, what, now I'm going to show you that, how that can happen, how you can have a, a sort of a, a general big effect that affects like the PCAs, but it doesn't get caught by say quantile normalization or other, or some of these other really strong normalizing approaches that make global characteristics similar. All right, no questions? Okay, so let's go, to, let's, let's now start talking about how, to, how can we deal with this. So now I'm going to use a little bit of math, so we'll go a little slower. It is Saturday, right? So it's a perfect day for doing hard <laughs> mathematics. All right, so here, it, this is a fake data, it's somewhat fake data set that I created for illustri illustrative purposes. It's, it's not completely fake because all, it all comes from real data. But what is fake about it is that I picked samples so that I would have a batch effect and a real effect that I know has a real signal, but I confound, and I confounded it, but not completely. Right? Does that, just look at it for a little bit and you'll see, you'll see what I mean. I so uh, ma females are more common in October than, ma than males, right? That's what that says, and vice versa. So if, if I just blindly run this, the October effect will be confused with the sex effect, if I just do it blindly. And I, in this picture, I'm going to be showing this picture uh, over and over again. This is a subset of the data. 
the analysis we're going to do are, gonna, are, are run on the entire data set. But for the pictures, I've selected a subset so you can see, see what's going on. So I want you to tell me, class, what... I, I have three groups there. What are the three groups in those, in those subset of genes I selected? How did I select those three groups? Uh, and let me say... Uh, oh, no, you can figure it out. Right, so that, that up there at the top, you can see, you already saw it, right? It's, it's, that's the sex effect. So there's, and you can maybe figure out how I got those. What, do you th what, what genes do you think I, I picked to get that? Y it's the X, it's the Y chromosome, right? The Y chromosome is high on males and off on females. I also have the X it's up there somewhere because some genes escape X inactivation, so they'll also be real. So those are going to be, so now I'm going to introduce some, some languages that are going to be very important going forward in genomics, and it already should have been. Um, these are, I'm going to call these true, I'm going to call these, sorry, not true. I'm going to call those the positive controls. They're controls because I know that they should be different. And they're positive because they should be different. Okay, now, the, actually, the, the entire, the, entire uh, the, um, the rest of the, a, a random sample of, genes should be a negative control here because there's nothing else, there's no other difference here. But sometimes it's nice to have, we don't have positive controls, uh, sorry, we don't have, we don't really have negative controls in this experiment. A negative, con a negative control would be an, a, a, a set of genes that I know for sure cannot change between males and females. So now that you're, you're starting to see that more that people are, are starting to spike in stuff or, or, or design their, their technologies to have these negative controls. It's not as common, but it's starting to happen more. Because it's really powerful for, for, for dealing with these things. Okay, so we got, we got group number one. Now what about group number two? What's, what's the other interesting group I have there? Yes, here they are, right? So you have the 9 and 3 that are from June or for October, and then the 9 and 3, and then the 3 and 9, and the 9 and 3. So those are genes that are differentially expressed across state. So now what we're going to do is we're going to forget that we did this. To imitate, what will we do in, in a real data set? We're going to forget we did this, but we won't forget when we, when we assess, when we assess the results. But when we do the analysis, we're not going to use this. We were, we were given a data set, and we were told, you know, here's the data set. There's um, cases and controls. We don't know they're males and females. We're just two conditions. Um, and I want, as, you know, as, as, as data analysts, our goal is to report back genes that are differentially expressed. So what will we do in that scenario? All right, so the first thing we, we, have, we learned in class, I imagine, is to do a t-test. And this is what a t-test looks like when you do linear algebra. Haven't done linear algebra yet? A little bit? Well, Leslie had a bunch. Uh, Christina had a bunch yesterday. <laughs> well, but I'll try, I'm going to try to break it down a little bit. Because it's really, it really, it's so much easier to show, for I me, mean, at least for me, <laughs> to show it this way. Okay, but what does this all mean? So here's how we do, here's how we've done things with, when we didn't know about batch effects, here's how we used to do things. So we have this matrix that has M genes and N samples. Here it is. That's Y. That's the data. And we also have these covariates that we care about. In this, this case, it's um, 2 by the number of samples, 12, uh, 24. So what are the two covariates? What are the two things here? One is the intercept, the mean level. I don't know why I'm going like this. The mean level. And then what's the other one? What's the other x in this particular example? Male, female. So if you're a 
Ma let me see, the, the males or females, like, which, which should be the zero. So, so we have so one of them is going to be zero, and one of them is going to be one. Right? So if, let's, if we're, comp actually, I should do how I did it. And I think, probably went by alphabetical order. It'll, it'll show up later. Wait, on is red. Yeah, I don't know. Anyways, it'll come up later, which, which is which. But, so this is, so this, this is another matrix. It's up here, right? So it has, um, actually, it's, it's, it shouldn't look like, it shouldn't be so long, because this one's just, it just has 0, 0, 1, 1. I'm sorry, 0, 1, 1, what was I saying? 1, 1, 0, 1. I'm, right? that, but then it has all the samples. So it has, oh, that's why it's long. So you have a bunch of ones on the top, and then the second row is either zero or one, depending on your male or female. That's what that is. And now what is this one? This is the beta. These are the effects that we're estimating. So what is this? How do you interpret this guy? What's beta? What beta is mostly what in, real, in, in this model? It's mostly zeros, because there's no effect. For most genes, beta is zero, the, the, the one we care about, the one that has to do with sex. The slope one, we don't really care about. The, the intercept one, we don't care about. So this one, every gene gets one beta for the intercept and one beta for the sex effect. So we have every gene has one. So we're, we want to estimate this guy, the column on, that has the sex effect. So each gene has one, and when you do a t-test, when you guys do a t-test on each gene, without realizing it, you're fitting this model. When you use Lima, did you guys use Lima? No? DSeq, oh yeah, DSeq does this, except it's a GLM, but yeah. So it's just Lima, DSeq, all these things do the same thing. They, they basically fit a model like this and they estimate one of these parameters. And the t-tests that you get are tests for those coefficients being zero or not. So we, I, said, I said most of these are zero, but we actually don't know that. We, we think that's the case, but we don't really know. And we don't know which ones it is. That's why, we're, that's why we get data. We basically get data to figure out this column. That's why we get data. We, all this stuff is reduced to this column, and we're going to say, give me the genes where that beta seems not to be zero. That's why we do all this. That's why we spend these thousands of dollars to do that. All right, now, then there's this stuff here. This is the, er we call it the error. So the, if there is a, so you have now 24, 12, and 12, let's say there's an effect of being, um, let's say there's no effect for that particular gene, so you have, everybody should, has to be the same, according to this part of the model, everybody's the same. Beta 1, the first column is some number that tells you the mean, and, the, uh, and there's no effect of being female or male, so they all have to have, have sa the same value. They all have to be seven. But they're not seven. They're moving around. One's A, one's seven, one's 7.1, 6.2, 8.3. That's here. That's the error. And that's all that stuff, but we don't know what it is. It's measurement, it's all this stuff that doesn't, that, that makes it so it's never that simple. It's never just men are one, uh, men's are eights, females are nines. It's never like that. There's always noise. If you make a box plot, there's, there's some, there's never, it's never like perfectly divided. So that goes all in the error. Right? That's, that's what this means. And here, are, here's, the, here's what, the, what they actually look like. Right? You have, this is the intercept, here's the zeros and ones. And then you have for each gene, one beta for the intercept, one beta for the effect we care about. So we, wanna, we really care about this column here. When we do the seq, we're estimating this column and getting standard errors for it and creating tests and then deciding it's significant or not. All right, so, so now what we're going to do is we are going to um, show a little problem with this model. When we do, go, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that, why is the first row entirely one? So think about what 
Um, ah, where am I going? Okay. Think about, so this, one of these, one of these rows, right, is, that's the gene expression for everybody, okay? So imagine you have no effect for of sex in that row, okay? So now the model has to have, oh, that's a lot to erase. Ah, maybe I don't have to write, but, but now my model says why, what I, can you see here? My model have to ha <laughs> I was about to say, why don't people throw it away? <laughs> y is equal to something plus the error, right? Yeah. Ah, okay, so we, there's a lot of mathematical reasons for making this error have no, have mean zero. So that means that when I look here, when I look at those numbers, they're not oscillating around zero. They're oscillating around some number, seven, eight, whatever the, whatever the gene expression is for that gene. So I need here a beta zero to account for that. Right? So there's seven, eight, nine, ten, right? So in, that, in one of those rows, it's going to be seven plus error. So I need the one plus beta one times, I'm sorry. I need the one this is this guy zero there's no effect but I need the one to, to have that seven every almost every model you, 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 you work with in statistics will have an intercept to explain the fact that things aren't just zero but they're very uh, they're, they're, they're just there kind of to, do, to make the math work out there and they're rarely looked at Sometimes they are. Like if you wanted to know if it, how expressed is a gene, forget about sex, that's, that's a parameter that tells you that. And when you do, when you do LIMA or, 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 or DSeq, those guys, what are, what's going to be the p-value for those beta zeros when you do DSeq or LIMA? There's a good quiz question. Are the p-values going to be small or, bi or, or not that small? Or? small? Super small. They're all not zero. But who cares? Right? They're all not zero, because there's something. There's some level. <coughs> there's some level that's not zero. So is that beta zero always the same number between all? No, because different genes have different levels. Okay. Right? So that, that's why you need something flexible. Otherwise, if we were just one number, we would just put that number there. Right? So, so here, you notice that they all have an index. Because the levels of the genes are different. And in microarrays, there's a probe effect, which makes that happen. It's not, it's not biology. It's just some genes are more. Actually, in sequencing, we have, we have a tool like the PCR effect. Some genes are just higher expressed than others, M many times due to technical reasons. Yeah? OK, sorry. You know what? This is. T uh, this is See, there's no comma here. Yeah. This is just a. I'm sorry, I should have said that. These are just the dimensions. These aren't indices. Yeah. So then, what explicitly what M and the genes are? M is twenty thousand genes. So M is genome. Mm -hmm. N is twenty four people. P is two number of parameters. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. So that's that's that. So here's here's a here's a related. And related to these questions, now that you are clear on what the epsilons are, another assumption that we make when we, when we compute t-tests and get p-values for them, or if you do DC, get something else, but it's similar, we assume that the columns of, of the errors, the errors are what, independent. They don't, they don't relate to each other. They're just measurement errors. It, it has nothing to do with who you are or what gene. It's just, it's just error. It's random error. But does this look like random error? It's not random error at all. These guys are more like each other than these. These see all these are very much like each other. All these are very much like each other. That's not that's not independent error. So the model is wrong. The, the, you, this is something you know. The, the R doesn't tell you 
You're assuming it's independent. Be careful. It doesn't, you, they just think, they just assume you know what you're doing. But it's, you are making that assumption when you compute these p-values. So this does not look like the typical, what in statistics we say IID, independent identically distributed error. But really what that means is the errors can't be dependent. There can't be little groups. If there's little groups, all this theory goes out the door. And thus, everything you say is wrong after that. So just to very briefly to connect it to what we do with the dependent prediction, you could say that X is the row of X is the factor mm -hmm. that makes the different level. And then the data that's not the, the, the boring one, but the interesting one is the difference of the means between the two. That, the estimate. That's the estimate of beta, right? Yeah, the estimate of the difference of the means. So beta is the truth. And the numerator of the t-statistic is your estimate of beta. And the denominator of the t-statistic is the variance. It has to do with the variance of this and the number of samples you have. Yeah, so why, why don't I just do a t-test? You know, it would have been a little bit easier. The reason we don't do it, one of the reasons we don't do a t-test is because as you go forward, you're, it, things are going to get a little bit more complicated. It's not always just going to be two things. There'll be more than one thing. There'll be more than two things. There'll be time series. There'll be things like the effect of age on gene expression. And now age is not 0, 1. It's just a continuous thing. All those examples fit into this model. It's a much more general model. And it also, it, the other reason we do it like this is because when we do batch effects, we're going to put it into here. OK, so here's what happens when we, when we just do a t-test blindly. All right, so are we, are we all in agreement that we should not see much in terms of differential expression between male and female, except for the chromosome X and Y? Right? I mean, it's not that different. Um, but that's, we're going to assume that's the case. We're going to assume that we shouldn't see that. So, but in general, this is a very powerful plot when you, when you have batch effects. Because what ha what's happening here is, here I have, the, these are the genes. When, you, when you're worried about a batch effect, you want to do the following. You want to, if you can, it's very powerful. You want to grab a group of genes that are either negative controls or you will you think that, out of, you know, that most of the great majority of them are negative controls. So in many examples, all the genes can be, can be thought of this way. All, if you just take all the genes, you're saying, this is an experiment where I'm testing some small little effect. Most genes are probably not differentially expressed. So they're, it, as a group, they're negative controls. And if there are some, some things that are different, it shouldn't be that many. But that's not always the case. But that's one thing you can do. Here, we're lucky in that we think that this is um, a case where the genes that are on the autosomes are not differentially expressed. And the Y chromosome genes should be differentially expressed. So when we look at this picture, this looks pretty good. right? There's seven genes of the Y chromosome genes came out as differentially expressed. and four didn't. Seven out of 11, that's, that's pretty good. So we caught seven out of 11 are actually have small p-values, great. Now here's what, what's worrisome. This big chunk of genes, it's like, uh, I don't know, like 25% of the, of, the, of the totality, maybe, what's that, maybe 15 to 20%, like whatever area this is of the total area are coming out as differentially expressed. And that's what, that we, I'm pretty convinced, that's all batch effect. So what's happening is some genes are, are, conf are somewhat confounded. Some genes are, are susceptible to, to the date, and the date is somewhat confounded with sex. So those genes come out as differentially expressed. So what, when we're testing out a, a batch effect procedure, a batch effect corrector, which we're about to get into. We haven't done it yet. The, these, the, the solutions that are out there are not perfect. They're not, they're not fail-safe. In fact, they fail maybe more than they, they succeed. 
but sometimes they work. So this is why it's important to, to have a good way of, of visually seeing if the thing is working or not. And this is what we're going to do here. We're, gonna, we're testing out different procedures and we're going to see which procedure brings this down while keeping this as it is. So we, want, we, we probably want this to be flat, right? Did you guys cover the p-value distribution? Yeah. Sure. We probably want this to be flat and we want, this, we want all of these to be in here. That would be the, base, the, 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 the optimal outcome. All right, so the first method I'm going to talk about is combat. And so yeah. the idea is that you, you put in some compiling, but you're never going to use explicitly the state, right? Because I am. For combat, I am. And then I'm going to explain what, what, how you do it when you don't know the dates. That's, that's basically what we're going to explain. Yeah? Yeah. Between ethnic groups. Oh, but what? The ethnic group's gone. I, didn't, I don't use it here. I've created... Yes. I made it. I selected the, the samples so that this would be a case where I could pretend I'm trying to find differentially expressed genes, and I know the answer should be just Y axis, Y, y chromosome. Right? I'm, I'm pretending so that I can assess the, proceed, the statistical procedures. I don't, I'm not, the biology is no, not interesting here. Uh, but I want to have a case where I, do, where I do know the biology so that I can know if my, if my statistical algorithms are working. No more questions? All right, so the first, I, I'm using this, this, uh, these specific names, but I, they're just general approaches. I shouldn't just stick to the names. Combat is the most famous one of these. Um, but there's others. And the general idea is the following. So what we're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, we know, we, we know there's a batch effect, and we know that, we know the date. We know that these were done in different dates. So what I'm gonna say now is I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that there is a date, there's a year effect, and I'm gonna have a, parameter try to grab that. So I'm going to say there's, there's three things here. There's the mean level, then there's the effect of the year. So I'm going to have a beta to capture that. And then I'm going to have another beta to capture what I want, which is the sex effect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a third column. So here's, we saw this one, and we saw this one, and now I'm adding a third one. And that's the date. Actually, I put, it on, I put it over here. It's good. I'm glad I did that. So here, these are the two we had before. This is the intercept, this is the sex, and this is the date. So now, again. Yeah. So in this case, we know that it's date. Yeah. Oh, we're getting to that. <laughs> yeah, good. I'm glad you're thinking that way, because this is actually very rare that we, you know, even when you, I mean, even, well, you'll see, I'll, it'll, it'll get, we'll get there. But, but this, is the, this is the plan. We, we think, we assume that the only thing that matters here in terms of batches is the date. It's the year, not the date, the year. So now, now, now this is easy. Now we just fit it. We just fit this model. Combat does something a little bit more fancy and sophisticated. But, you know, it's, it basically comes down to fitting this model, which is easy. It's a linear model. You fit it. You, you now get, you get your betas. And now the betas that we, you know, the, the be, now, the, now we can trust these betas a little more because whatever was making these betas become big when they shouldn't have been big, are, it should be going over here. That, that should be absorbed by this other column. So here are the, here's the histograms. Here's before and here's after. Did you see that? Did you see how it went down a little bit? Look at, look at, the, look at the, the, the histogram on the right. Stage right, your left. You see, it went down. It, went, it was up, wow, ah, it was up like at 13,000, 1,300, and then it went down to like 1,000. And over, over there, we had, we had one guy, one of the genes here moved to a p-value from 0, less than 0, whatever this is, 0.025 to a little bit higher. That's not a big deal. 
but we, we lost a lot of false positives, which is good. Went down. But it didn't go down to flatness. And now we're getting to your question. So here's the thing. Here, this is now, this is the... So the problem with using things like just the year or, or, or even the day is that it's not... My experience and the experience of many others is that there's much more in there than just date. And we don't even know what they are. And even with date, here, here are the, uh, here are, uh, these are all the samples from this big study. And I'm plotting them in, um, in order of when they were hybridized. And here's the date. You see the, you see the, there's these jumps, but what is a batch exactly there? Is, is this, is going from here to here a batch? Uh, this, I would guess that this jump is something that we might consider a batch, but then uh, everything else is not that obvious. And even in the little fake example I made, you, we had, what is it that we had? We had October and June. This is now the, the actual day. So there's three days in June, and there's two days in, in October. So is that also? So we also have an X for the day? How about the hour? Now if we keep going that way, we're going to exhaust the, the, the you know, we're going we're gonna to have a, a design matrix that's too big and it won't work. Yeah? Yeah. So yep. Okay. This is yeah, absolutely right. But let me let me make one clarification about the 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 type. What makes a batch effect is not variability. It, it has it's so now that now we're getting to to the essence of what it is. It's correlated variability. So if you let, let let's say there's circadian patterns, right? So if you pick, so everybody know what that is as genes that follow a, a pattern during the day. It's up th during the day and it's down at the, like the go to sleep gene and the it's time for breakfast gene. Uh, so they, you know, they oscillate. There's a, there's a few of them. Uh, and that, that's, that variability is not of interest in most studies. Some studies actually study circadian patterns, but if you're interested in, in ethnic differences, you don't care about that. You just want to know which genes are different. So every person you, that, that you, every individual for, that you include in this, in this study, you took their tissue sample at some d day, at some hour during the day. So that's, that variability of circadian pattern will be there. But if, you, if the hour that you took their tissue is random, then it's not, a, it's not considered a batch effect. It's just variability, and that's okay, because that gets caught in the t-test and the denominator and then all that's going to happen is that circadian pattern genes will have bigger variance. But we do take that into account. DSEQ, Lima, they estimate the variance of the gene. The, the, the problem would be if you did the following. If you had one group of people that were, that were taking their blood at 8, another group of people, you took it at 1 p.m., that would be a batch effect. Well, yeah, you could you could schedule it at either at the same time if you want to if you don't if you don't want to if you just want to control for that or randomly do it or balance it in some way. Okay, so um, yeah, so we can take a break after after this and then we'll continue. So so now now we're gonna basically what we're gonna do is instead of trying to model all this stuff with like figuring out is it this is it, we're gonna use math and statistics to try to estimate the batch effects, and this is something that's been around for a long time also, and it's called factor analysis. And um, we'll take a little break and we'll come back and and um, and and I'll teach you what this is and how we can use it. <laughs>